You're listening to the Men's Dating Mastery Podcast with host Alec Chase, bringing you the experts in dating, sex, and relationships. Welcome to another episode of MDM, guys. I feel honored to have today's guest on the show with me. His name is Zan Perion, and he has often been described as a modern-day Casanova. The two things that I personally like about Zan are that he lives his life with a great sense of freedom and he genuinely loves women. As men, we all lust for women, but it is rare to meet a man who truly loves the feminine spirit. In this episode, Zan and I talk about his reputation as a womanizer and why he does not apologize for it. We talk about being dirty and direct in your communication with a woman. The difference between a sexually forward man who's appealing to women versus one who makes them feel uncomfortable. We talk about compliments and the things that make them work or fail. The Madonna whore complex, which are two innate qualities in in a woman and how a man can get in touch with both of them. The concept of the natural and Zan's take on relationships. This conversation had a really positive impact on me personally, so I hope that it does the same for you. As always, if you like this episode, then please take a moment to subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and what I hope will be a positive review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Without further ado, here's Zan. Hey, Zan, it's an honor to have you with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to start talking a little bit about you in case there's anyone out there that hasn't heard of you yet, because I think much of the world has, but you've got a pretty interesting story, and I think you start out in literally the wilderness in northern Canada, Uh moved into the city, had a corporate career, and then packed things up, went and traveled the world. And since then, you've been an author, a men's coach, actor, speaker. Uh, You've been somebody that a lot of people in the seduction community really look up to. What am I missing? Boy, (laughs) well, not much, I guess. I mean, like I I did grow up in, in northern Canada. Uh, kind of in the wilderness, and I went into the corporate world for a lot of years. I was a computer nerd, and uh, yeah, I was corporate. And um, yeah, last ten or so more years, I've been wandering the earth in a carry-on bag, and talking to men about women, talking to women about men. So yeah, you pretty much nailed it. And that latter part, with respect to talking to men about women. What is it that you do currently? Because you've got a book out, you you do a lot of things actually. Yeah, like I have my my philosophy, I guess you could call it, is is Ars Amorata, which is fake Latin for the art of love. And it's you know, it's been the brand and the and the thing we've had for years. We've got a, a network of men around the world who have taken our programs and who who buy into it. Um and they they are called the Amorati just for fun, because it's a, a, a fake Latin word, too. And we've got members all over the world. I've done workshops. I've done lectures in universities. I've done one-on-one coaching. I've done. I've spoken at women's groups from Sweden to Texas. And uh, so I've done a lot of talking, a lot of public speaking. I wrote a book called The Alabasta Girl. It took me 10 years to write it, birthday to birthday. Uh, really took a lot. Yeah, everything I knew had learned over the years is stuffed into that book. And um, yeah, so it was a very difficult process, a very difficult thing to do, but it's done and it's getting good reception and people reading it and I'm getting emails every day of people enjoying it. So I've read the reviews on that book and uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen a single disappointed customer yet. I think uh, it's really resonating with guys, especially guys that uh, went through the whole pickup community and came out on the other end a little bit disillusioned. They think they're finding some wisdom in that book that's really resonating with them. Yeah. And what's interesting is I started to write a book to men because I was trying to write a book to my young self who was lost and lonely and insecure and couldn't figure it out. So I started to write that kind of a a wisdom book to myself, I guess you could say. And it ended up being, after all many years and fighting and tearing out my hair and walking the beaches and in different parts of the world and sitting in the jungles, you know, sweating it out. It en- ended up eventually being a, a book not written to men, but written to women. So it's a book about women written to two women. Oh, wow. Uh, how presumptuous is that? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's, uh, you know, people are liking it, so I, I guess it's not that presumptuous. That's really great stuff, and uh, I'm really excited to be able to extract a little bit of wisdom out of your brain today. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about is you've got this reputation for not apologizing for being a womanizer, for expressing your desire for women, and for just really owning that. I've actually heard you say, or I've read you say that there's no reason to hide that you know, having that reputation can actually be attractive in the eyes of a woman. Can you talk a little bit about that and just explain the thought behind that statement? Yeah, like, I don't believe you should ever apologize to anyone ever for no, for no slight. If you, if you, you know, hurt somebody or do something that's untoward, yeah, you should apologize. You, you did a, you, you did a slight, I guess you could say, but, but for being who you are, like my whole nature my honest nature, my honesty is that I am a lover of beauty. I'm a lover of life. I'm a lover of women. I adore women. And for me to, um, to apologize for that makes some sense in my mind. So, and, and I'm, you know, I realize talking, I've been talking to a lot of men lately. Um, our members of the Amirati have been connecting with all of a lot of them on a one-on-one -on -one basis and just checking in with them, see, see how their journey is going and what's going on with them. And one thing I really get a sense of is that I am very unique in that I have this overwhelming and, and ever abiding uh, love for the spirit of women right? and, and for the for what women bring into the world. And I'm not and, and I'm not talking all women because there's some women who are, are petty and, 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 and mean spirited and and just not nice people, just like there's men like that. So I'm not talking about every single woman is something to be cherished and adored and, and, and candy coated, you know, sugar and spice. But I do believe in the, f the, the essence of the female spirit. And when you meet a woman who embodies that, the great life giving force that is a feminine nature, it breaks your heart as a man. So, um, I don't apologize for my love of women. I don't apologize for anything. I, d I don't defend myself. I don't try and explain myself. It's, I, I know who I am. I love, I love life. I love the, you know, I, I have a girlfriend for three years. I love my girlfriend. She's with me day and night. And, and it doesn't change who I am at all. I'm a lover of women and lover of the, of the female spirit. I'm a great advocate for women. That's really nice. It's resonating with me because what I'm hearing is you go into the world with the best of intentions and you own it and there's no reason to apologize for that. And I think, there's a lot of shaming when it comes to a man's desire for a woman or, you know, around sexuality in general, particularly in the Western part of the world, you know, where I live and where you used to live. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I think what you just described is a nice, healthy alternative. And extrapolating that a little bit, when I told a few of my friends that I was having you come on the podcast, somebody said, oh, Zan, he's like this really spiritual guy, right? <laughs> and... I don't think he was the first person to say something along the lo those lines. I know you've got a reputation for coming across as a little poetic, but I've done a little bit of my own homework and I know that that's not necessarily true when it comes to women. I saw you in a YouTube video with Brent, who's a friend of yours and uh, someone who's been in the community for a long time as well. And I've heard you talking about being very dirty and very direct with women and just not being afraid to be sexually explicit with them and say things exactly as you're thinking them. So I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there's no discrepancy between a man uh, owning his masculine edge and, and, and honoring his God-given sexual nature, because it comes from God, for sure. I mean, like, this is, who we're, this is our birthright. And we, in the West, we're taught to subjugate that and to hide it and, and hide your light under a bushel and, and be sensitive, asexual males. And I don't buy any of that. And I'm, and you know, I'm, I'm very much a, a poet. I mean, my entire 400 page book is really a big poem to me because I like words and I like the way words go together. And, and I guess it's it construed over the years because I've heard this too, that Zan is this, you know, uh, um, 18th century opium poet that lays around and, and, and writes about, uh, you know, his beloved and, and nothing can be further than the truth. I'm the most direct guy I know. I'm massively direct. I, I'm, I'm extremely direct and, and delighted to, be, to, to present myself as a man and here's a woman with full respect and full honor without being a, an aggressive, like, lecherous creep. 
but to let her know that that there's that you're a woman and I'm a man and there's a polarity there that I like it and there's a chemistry and I can feel it and you can feel it too, and I'm calling it forth. So I'm very much uh, I'm very much. That, for instance, in the seduction community, there's these there's this concept of stages where there's a comfort stage and you get to know the girl and and now you you, you shift into a different stage and then there's a um, uh, seduction phase or lover phase, whatever. And then there's a last minute, last minute resistance phase. And none of that exists in my world. I don't, none of that exists. It's not something that you think about because everything that when I talk to a girl and I like her and I, and I can feel that there's an energy that of her that, is, that draws my heart. I think, wow, I like this girl. I announce it. I say it. If I want her in my bed, I tell her, this is, you'd be a great lover for me. I tell her that right away. And so all of the, these, uh, "Quote unquote stages are conflated into 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 the first three minutes, including the last minute resistance. Everything she knows what I'm about. There's no mystery about me. I like you. Uh, you should be a great lover for me. I would I would love to see you again. You look fantastic. I should I, I would like to see you every day. I don't even live here in Poland, but I would like to see you every day. Uh, well, there's something you said that I think is important for guys to understand, and that's you're able to be as direct as you are, but you you said you do this with honor and without being a creep and so what's the difference between a guy who is very sexually explicit very direct doesn't hide his desires and communicates that with his language and with his body language versus a guy who on the surface might appear to be doing the same thing but comes off as just a big jerk and misogynistic because women do complain about that as well what separates those two guys one to whom women are responding positively and the other one to is not just turning them off, but making them feel very uncomfortable. What distinguishes those two people? Well, I think it's empathy. And, and really, I do. Because I think it's like, it's, it's wanting the other person to join in an experience that is going to be equally uh, bright for both. As opposed to trying to take something or trying to conquer, which is the whole, which is, you know, seduction has a bad rap because it's about how to manipulate and, in a lot of people's minds and how to lead her astray. But seduction really is allowing her to do what she she would love to be able to do if if she was given the the, the right safe space. So um, uh, the difference is that is empathy and a full honor and respect that you command with your voice and with your with with your actions and with your words. I can be I can be I can say something uh, fundamentally dirty to a girl who's elegant and innocent and we think oh boy you can never say that to her and I can say it and she will not be offended because of the because of the full sense of I'm sharing something with you as opposed to trying to take something from you and I'm honoring that there's a there's a code of conduct around certainly around the the way that the world views women there's an unfair uh, if a man you know has sleeps around a lot he gets a reputation if a woman sleeps around a lot, she's really outcast from all kinds of circles. And, and so there's an honor around that, even though women are fundamentally thinking about sex more than men. They're, 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 they have it in their, in their mind more than men. They meet men, they're thinking, wow, could I have sex with this guy or not? I'm trying to get a picture of it. And, and I know this from women. So, but they have to hide it universally because they're the ones that, who are judged, which is unfair. It's just the way it is. And... And so um, the difference is that I'm letting her know I'm not being a pig and staring at her at her breasts. I don't mean, I'm not like doing anything like that. But I'm letting her know, wow, I like the, the whole concept of, of the girl I see in front of me. You intrigue me and I don't know why. There's something about you that's drawing me. The way you're dressed, your red lipstick, the way you touch your hair, there's something, the way you smell. There's a, there's a fantastic image before me that I'm intrigued holistically, not just, okay, you have a beautiful smile and I'm drawn to that, uh, or your personality is so fantastic. I'm drawn to you as a man is drawn to a woman. And I will let that be known. And I'm a man who, 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 who is fully respect, full honor. I will be charming and I'll do all these wonderful things that, uh, that is social norm and social graces. And if you cross this line here, I'm going to bend you over with delight. So that's my whole message to, to, to women. This is who I am. It actually sounds like there's two things going on there. The first is being direct, and a lot of people, just because of the way we've been conditioned, might associate that with 
being very aggressive. But to flip that on its head a little bit, it actually sounds like in the process you're revealing a lot about yourself. By revealing your desire and by revealing your infatuation with that woman, you're taking a slightly different approach there. Mm -hmm. What that's leading me to think about is, particularly in the early days in the seduction community, guys were taught to be aloof by some coaches. So, you know, lean up against the bar, you know, don't face her, look over the shoulder, feign indifference, things like that. But it sounds like that's not what you're doing. If you're really into a woman, you let her know. And from what I think I know of you, you don't shy away from giving compliments either. No, not at all. Because, you know, that whole thing of being aloof, that's what I would call artificial unavailability. In other words, you're pretending that I'm not interested. I'm pretending I have lots of options. I'm pretending that uh, you're just another girl. And, and um, as opposed to a man who's moving through life toward his horizons, toward his, his vision of how he wants his life to be, he's on his, on his spiritual journey, he's on his adventure, he's going out to see. He's going to, to see what's on, he's going to look for magic and treasure on the, on the other side over there. And he's going... And he meets a woman and he says, and he says his concept and his, his, what he's presenting to her is, I'm in love with this adventure I'm on and I'm going there in that direction and I would love you to come because you are highly delightful to me and you look fantastic, which is high compliment. And you're a beautiful woman and I love it with all, with every fire of my being. I would love to, to have you with me, but I'm going in this direction anyway. So, so there's, there's no artificial unavailability. But there's an unavailability of his soul. He's not, in other words, the reason I've, I've said for years that a woman doesn't want to be the adventure. She wants to be taken on an adventure. And the problem with us men is we meet a girl that we think is the most incredible thing in the world and we turn all our attention on her and, and we, and we shower her with affection and we put her on a pedestal and we're this super nice guy. We massage her for hours. We do all these great, wonderful things and we lose sight of the fact that we're, that we're still men that have to go out to sea. We have to go, we have to go foraging out there because that's where it's at out there, holding our hand as we do it. And the problem is it's too cloistered, too, too clinging and too hanging on a woman that it, it, they're, they're, they're overwhelmed by it. So artificial availability is pretending I don't, I don't need you. And the great spirit of, of a, of a man with a heart of adventure and the stallion is heart is I absolutely need you. I, I would, I would love to have you in my heart and I'm going anyway. This is why women like the proverbial jerk. It's because he has drama in his life that isn't her. He's like, he's dealing with his own stuff over here, and the woman's bugging me. What are you doing, woman? And he, and he, and he showers with her affection, and, he's, and he cuddles with her in bed. And then, he, and then at there's times when he's like dealing with his stuff over here, and he's like, get off my back and leave me alone. He's, he's being a, an asshole to her because he isn't putting all of his drama on her, which is, the, which is what the nice guy does. He's like, everything circles around her. What I heard is that you can give a woman all these compliments as long as they're genuine. And what I mean by genuine is not just that they're real, but that in the process, you're not seeking to use her as something to fill a hole in your life. You've got a life and rather than seeking for her to make it for you, you're bringing her in. And from that frame, then you don't have to worry about giving off the impression of unavailability or appearing as if you're supplicating yourself by giving compliments. Would you agree with that? Yeah, because, you know, the thing about compliments that men don't understand is compliments have very little to do with the girl and everything to do with ourselves. In other words, we compliment with an agenda, which is, wow, which is subconsciously, if I compliment this girl's eyes or her smile or I buy her a drink, I will get something in return, perhaps. So we're looking, we have our, our compliments are all about us and what we can get. As opposed to a man who's moving through life, who loves beautiful things and is not afraid to say it. And so his compliments land on her side and stay. There's, he's looking for nothing in return. He has great desire, but no great desire and he'll express it, but no neediness in it at all. He can say, wow, you know what? Fundamentally, I'm, I'm sorry to stop you two girls from talking, but you look beautiful. You're a beautiful girl. And your friend here is incredible. He can say these things because they land over there. It's not like I'm going to say these and can I continue talking and will you like me now? And, and, and you see what I'm saying? We're, it is all about them. And, and it is all about he's putting it out to them as, as, as something that he likes to do. And that just ex, an expression of who he is. And he's just speaking how he likes the world. He's just saying it without 
agenda. Yeah, and the difference to me is giving versus essentially coercing her into some kind of transaction that she never agreed to, right? By expecting something in return. I really like that. I'd like to jump back to something you had mentioned earlier, and this is the suppressed sexuality of women. And you've talked before about women having two sides of them, the Madonna and the whore, and all women have this in them. And that a man that's really appealing to a woman knows how to tap into both of those sides. So can you talk about those inequalities, what they are, and how a man can really reach out and connect with both sides of a woman in that regard? Yeah, you know, if we if you've ever heard of legendary or known men who just seem to have like a, a natural um, affiliation with women, they just seem to like have women around them all the time. They're not the tallest, they're not the you know best looking guy, they're overweight or whatever. Yeah. They're not rich. And yet they always have women around them. What is that? It's because there's a spirit in those men. And I've never heard anybody say this before. I wrote about it in my book. Um, that is rare. And that is that they, the women have told me over and over again, I and mean, this is not new to us, it's academic and, and everything, philosophical. Women have this dichotomy in them, which is the, the mother spirit, which we would call the Madonna, and the, and the, the bad girl, which is the, the one who wants to be ravished. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Madonna horror complex, which is age old. And what, what these men have that other men do not have, and it's strong and it's fundamental is they have a spirit in them that appeals to both natures of both sides of the female nature simultaneously. In other words, these men, our father figures, strong, going out to sea, uh, going fighting battles, and it's simultaneously they're little boys that need that don't know how to wash themselves, that that can't figure out how to open the cookie jar. They're little boys that need help, and simultaneously, and and by that I mean there's a, there's a spirit in these men that say, "Thus far shalt thou go, and no further." They have their boundaries and they know what they want, and and they have this strong commanding presence, and they let women know that. Don't cross the lines because this is how I would like it to be. And at the same time, they are crawling in her lap like a kitten at the same time. And, and, and they go out and fight their battle. It's called the warrior's repose, where the warrior would go out from, you know, from the tribe and they'd fight these battles and they'd come back in and they're so strong and, they're, and they had to be so strong because they're the leaders of their tribe and they had to show this strength. And they come crawling back into their tent and they crawl into her lap and put their head down and she would stroke his hair and say, it's okay. In other words... He's so strong and out there into this world, and yet she takes care of him. That, that dichotomy of men where he's uh, this, this, this strong leadership father-type figure who says, this is how I want the world arranged around me, and, I, and, and it's a delightful way, and, and, and it's a strong strength in him, which modern man rarely has, and also the ability to be vulnerable and, and look to her as uh, because he's completely, you know, clueless and he doesn't know how to, you know, tie his tie. And she and she and women love, love, love to to be that woman to to it calls forth the mothering instinct instinct of a woman and also the 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 girl that needs to be bent over and, and spanked. It's 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 what it is. It's hard to describe in, in a bunch of words, but there's some, I'm, I'm fundamentally convinced that that is the essence of it. You know what, just as you were describing all that, I started drawing like a little dotted line in my mind between a woman's desire to to nurture and take care of her man and a man's desire to be needed. Because as guys, we we want to feel useful. We want to feel like, we want to feel needed. I mean, that's why so many men associated their sense of self-worth with their careers is because that's how they get that sense of being needed. And so it almost it almost sounded like there are these like a similarity between the genders, maybe expressed in slightly different ways, but uh, almost a parallel. Yeah, and you know, like I mean, the seduction community in its heyday got a lot of bad press because it was, you know, the it was all about you know, quote unquote, uh, teaching guys weekend workshops and how to how to manipulate women, get women's phone numbers, how to get in women's pants, and and the secret kind of like. Uh, the secret tactics and techniques, but the whole thing is like when nobody seems to understand is that is that a guy doesn't pay, for instance, two thousand dollars for a weekend workshop so that he can have sex 
he can use that two thousand dollars and buy that sex mm-hmm. many times not, over. He, yeah, yeah, he's not paying for sex or sexual techniques or sexual. How, what he's paying for is what you said. He wants to know that for the first time in his life, he can walk into any room, and he has what it takes. He can hold his own. That's all a man wants. That's what he's trying to buy. Is what he's trying to. That's the greatest desire of, of of since he was a little boy that he can hold his own with the others and he can he has what it takes. And and this is what is we're starved for. The men are starved. And this is what and and you know it's a uh, it's why we have this modern society that we have. I guess. That's funny. You actually just made me think of a friend of mine. You know, he's not a guy that's really struggled with women in his past. You know, he's been in very long-term, very meaningful, loving relationships, and he's dated. So nothing was seemingly missing from his life in that regard. But yet when he got out of his most recent longest-term relationship, he really wanted to know that he could walk into a bar or a club and be able to pick up a woman. And it was really interesting to me because, you know, he's very successful at online dating, and, you know, he meets women other areas of his life. But he just wanted to be able to pick up a woman in that kind of setting and it's not because he didn't have women in his life or he didn't have sex in his life. He had as much as he wanted or could ever want, but he just wanted to know that he could. Really reminded me of him. Exactly right. Yeah. That's the whole essence of it. You actually have a product called The Way of the Natural. This is something that's been thrown out a lot over the last couple of years. Guys claiming to teach other guys how to be a natural. And then, and there are a lot of different connotations of what that word means. A lot of people think it's a guy that's just got a ton of confidence and a ton of charisma. A lot of people say it's something that you're just born with. What does being a natural mean to you? What is that? Well, I think um, like anybody who has any kind of facility, I guess you could say, with interacting with women, um, has it because he learned it. And no one's born of it. You, you, it's, the difference is, and I've been saying this for years, the difference between men who have any kind of successful interaction with women and men who do not, or success in business or success in, you know, just about anything, is that they, they know that they have deficits. For instance, they might run out of things to say or they're nervous or they are, um, or they're not tall, for instance. They know that they've got these, these, these seeming deficits that other men would, would hide behind and, and stay at home and play World of Warcraft and wish for a girlfriend, but I don't, I've got this, all this, these troubles, so I can't do that. The difference between men who have any kind of success is that they see all these because we all have it, and they act anyway. In other words, they show up. Woody Allen said that 80% of success is just showing up. And these men will, will go up to him and say, you know, um, I'm nervous to talk to you because to me, you're, you're, you look, you look fantastic, but I had to come say hi to you or, or I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm probably going to run out of something to say, but here I am. I'm, I had, I had to say something. So the women don't care if we're nervous because they're nervous too. I've, 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 thousands of women have told me that they don't care if we're nervous. In fact, it's a little endearing to them because they're vulnerable and, and, and they're not all confident and. And, and so they, they want to have that human humanness too. They don't care if we're nervous. They just care if we show up or not. And so the whole essence is if, if a man would just show up in his nervousness and his, in his quietness and whatever, but show up and say, you know, here I am anyway, I want to say hi to you. His life would change. I mean, this is the whole secret. I don't say it. This is the whole secret of the whole um, dating coach industry that takes guys out into the field, quote unquote, is that. Um, they go out there and they say, "I'll go talk to those girls, and I'll go talk to those girls, and I'll go talk to those girls." And by the end of the night, that guy who's never talked to a girl before has talked to twenty-five different girls, and he got rejected a bunch of times. And the girls turned away from him and said, uh, "Leave us alone, we're talking." And some girl smiled at him, and some girl asked his name, and he feels more alive than he has ever because he did something, which is get out of his basement suite and go into the land of women and. In spite of all his insecurities and all of his nervousness, he was forced to because he had somebody with a with a boot up his ass and go do it, go talk to these women. He feels like so alive and so f- fulfilled. And 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 the amazing thing is that he could do it himself if he had the way to self motivate himself. If he, he just went up, the guy went out and just said, "Listen, I'm going to talk to 25 girls tonight and just say hi, hi." That's it. He would feel, "Wow, what a night I had! Incredible." 
it sounds like it's really just about being real and, and allowing yourself to do what you actually want to do. And yeah, I've seen so much of that as um, I find these boot camps, uh, these weekend training sessions, the guys are paying thousands of dollars just to get a kick in the ass, really. Yeah, but don't knock that because I'll tell you this. And I used to think, you know, come on, man, I've seen dating coaches. I've been around forever. I was in the book, The Game by Neil Strauss. Mm -hmm. I know all the guys from mystery to you name it. I, I've known those guys for years. And, and, I've, and I've also known ones who are fly by night, who make a nice website, who've never had a girlfriend, who live in their mother's basement suite. And they're dating coaches. And you think, well, ho, ho, that's not right. That's like, come on, it's the blind being the blind. But I've also seen... I've, I've seen these guys with my, with looking through the, you know, through my hands, like I can't watch this, the train wreck. And I've seen them coach guys. And the guys come away from saying, you know, this guy, this guy changed my life. And I'm thinking, how, how is this possible? He's never really dated a girl himself. But the whole point is what we said before. What that coach brings to that guy, doesn't matter if they're teaching pickup, nonsense or any of this kind of stuff, is it gets the guy interacting with women. That, that motivation, which he, he, maybe he couldn't do it on his own because he just can't self-motivate. So that kick in the ass was, was worth more than $2,000 to that guy's life if it got him, if it shook him up a little bit. So I used to have the same mindset, you know, come on, man, that's like just, that's kind of like, you know, you know uh, manipulating men and taking money from them. And the promises are, the promises are manipulation. And we're going to promise you can get a supermodel uh, in three easy steps, that's that's all a crock. But boy, I tell you, the spirit of like taking guys out and saying, "Listen, whatever you do, go talk to that girl," is for some guys that's probably worth ten thousand, hundred thousand dollars because maybe they wouldn't do it for the next twenty years. But we're starting to run a little bit over time. How are you for time? I'm okay. You're okay. Yeah. So I've got two questions. One is purely out of my own curiosity, and then one for the guys. And being in the selfish mood that I am. I want to start with a question that I personally really wanted to hear you answer, and that's your take on relationships. I've heard you speak about this on a number of occasions, and I know that when it comes to relationships in the form that they are in our lives today, you tend to be a little bit critical about that, and you have your own view on what relationships are, what they should be, and how we can get the most fulfillment out of them. So I'd like to hear your take on that. Yeah. Um I am of the mind that, I mean, we have all kinds of combinations and permutations today of relationship. You know, it's like um, everything's open season, everything's game, everything's, the, the buzzword is open. And, and I wonder, have we advanced so long or so, so far along in our, in our um, state of consciousness about relationships that we don't have to go the old ways of, you know, a lid for every pot, one man, one woman, meet at, meet at church when you're 17 and start to court each other. You know, the old ways. I mean, we so enlightened that these new open relationships and this, this bouncing around and, uh, is a better way. I don't, I have no, no, no idea, to be honest, Alec. I just know that I'll say, maybe I can say it this way and I'll try and say it quickly. There's, and I've never heard anybody say this before, but in my mind, in my exploration, there's been, there's four levels in a man's love for women, four phases. The first phase is he's just starting out in his life. He starts his dating world and he finds, he falls in love with a girl and he, he can't, he's naive and he thinks he can never find a girl like this girl again. And he wants her forever and ever. Amen. And he really thinks that this is the girl of his dreams. And he's all excited and, and proud to be dating this girl and, and he wants to marry her and stay with her forever. And then that crashes and falls apart because it, life does it. And then he's like completely hurt and says, if I thought that was true love. And if that love could end, what love can last? And then he starts, then he falls in love with again and he breaks up again and he goes to this, to, to the second phase of his life where he realizes, well, you know, maybe things aren't so cut and dry. Maybe there's, I'm going to, I'm going to, play the field a bit. I'm just going to date and, you know, and, and maybe I'll find somebody who's a good companion. And so he gets this jadedness as hard. Women go through this too. So the first is he's naive and thinks that he's found his princess forever and ever. That falls apart. Goes to the second phase of his life, which is dating. And most men go back and forth between phase one and two till for the rest of their lives. They, they start dating around a bit. They have a bunch of girlfriends. They sleep around. Then they meet another girl, go into an eight-year relationship. 
That breaks up. They start dating again, trying to figure that out, and they get into another relationship that maybe lasts for the next 40 years. So those two phases. The third phase that of a man's love of women is, is he's dated or he's had these great love affairs and, he's, and his heart is heartbroken in his naivete. And he's had this, this phase of all these you know, dating and, and multiple girls and maybe some threesomes and experimentation, this kind of stuff, and open relationship type things and trying all this stuff. And then his next phase is he wants to understand his love for the female spirit. He want, his, his love and attraction is about the, the essence of the feminine spirit. Which most men never get into that kind of concept of like, wow, I want to understand the, the beauty of women and the spirit of women. And then the fourth phase, which very rarely men ever gets to, and I can just, I, I'm, I'm intuiting this. I think it's out of the corner of my eye. I can kind of see it. And that is this. He's seen all these things from phase one, phase two, breakups, deep heartbreaks, excitement, etc. He sees the calmness of loving the, the essence of the female spirit. And then... He sees all, the, all of these great things and all that essence of stage three, phase three, wrapped up in one woman again. So he goes full circle back to, like, you know, I'm with this girl now. And I know that, you know, I don't have the same uh, rose-colored eyes of my youth. I don't have the same jadedness of, and, and, and expect that she's going to cheat on me and do all this kind of bad stuff. And, and I'm going to, you know, capture her and, and keep her home and, 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 and have this insecurity wrapped around this this dating phase or this the second phase but he sees in her the 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 greatness of all women represented in her she's not perfect but she's a she's she's a delight and that man can stay with that woman because it, he comes back to full circle phase one with all the baggage and expectations and um and heaviness around it and he just exists and he said and that man can stay with that girl for the rest of his life he said that's my girl right there that's my girl so there's something in that to me. And, and I could be completely wrong. I mean, maybe the proper paradigm is open, um, non-monogamous relationships. Maybe that has to be, maybe that's the next, where we where, where really should be in, and we'll be more enlightened and, and happy in that phase. I have no idea. This is just my take on it. Thank you for that. I'm actually really happy I got to ask you that. To wrap up, I've got one question. I always ask this of my guests and that's, we could keep it in the context of the conversation we had today and extract just one piece of tangible advice, something that guys who really want to apply themselves and improve in their dating lives and their, or in their relationship lives, it was just one thing that they could start with today. And the reason I ask that is because there's an overwhelming amount of information out there and people get paralyzed by too many things, too much advice. So if you could just boil it down to one thing to get started with, what would it be? Well, I think, you know, the, the advice we always hear is like, just be yourself or be unattached to the outcome. But when you're, when you're, when you're young and you're lonely and you would be like a, a girl and you're horny, it's it, being unattached to the outcome is like, it's like saying, you know, you know, follow a budget. Yeah, it's great intentions, but it, you can't do it. So, um, the greatest advice I can give a guy who's trying to understand this is what I said earlier, which is just to show up anyway, to acknowledge that you're nervous and, and speak it to her. I'm nervous. Um, but I had to come say hi and what's your name? Just just to show up. Instead, we stand around with our beers and we wish. We watch the never-ending stream of girls walk by and we drink our beers until we get drunk and then we go, you know, then we're, like, we, we, we spit the beer all over her. You know, so it's like, it's like just to show up. I can't tell you how many women have told me how fundamentally lonely they are and they're beautiful women because no guy, has, no guy will come up and talk to them unless they're drunk and, and they're lonely. And I'm thinking, this, how can this be? All my advice to a guy is, is, is acknowledge all the things that are going on in your life. Yeah, I don't have any money right now. I don't have a job. And uh, yeah, I'm only uh, five foot five. And yeah, I've got these things that you know, are seemingly whatever. But I'm going to show up anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, well, at least I'm showing up. That's more than 98% of men will ever do. They'll stand around and wish and try and be cool and aloof. So the greatest advice I can do to men is just show up anyway. You don't need the opening lines. You don't need all the stories and, and, and memorization. You just have to, it, it, the simplest thing is you can walk up and say, hi. That's a great opening line, hi. And if you just do that and you don't know what to say next, that's okay too. You say that. I don't know what to say next, but I have to say hi. Thank you so much for that. I think there's 
Again, wisdom to be found in those statements. It's something that uh, I've come to through my own personal journey. To wrap up, tell us, uh, what do you have out right now? What are your products? Uh, how are you helping guys? How can they get in touch with you? Where can they find you? Okay. Um, my personal website is zanperion.com, Z-A-N-P-E-R-R-I-O-N.com. And ours on marada.com is our other website. It's the, it's the one for the, you know, all the, our programs and stuff. Ars Amrata, A R S A M O R A T A dot com. You can go buy my book, and I would encourage you to do it, and I would be delighted if you do it. It's called The Alabaster Girl, and it's available on Amazon, or just Google my name and, and you'll see it. The Alabaster Girl. Um, you can buy it in Kindle or print. And um, yeah, and I do one on one coaching, have for years. I do, I'm in Bucharest, Romania, and I have uh, what I affectionately call Casa Amarata. And I have uh, immersion coaching here in Bucharest, which is a, a coach in itself. The city is shockingly incredible and um, filled with women and, and, and delight. It's like, it's amazing here. And anyway, uh, so I do that about once a month. I have Casa Amarata experience and we have our online um university program and various things from you can see on zanperion.com or arzamrata.com okay fantastic and uh for all the guys listening all of the links uh, zan just mentioned everything will be in the show notes so you guys can find it there zan thanks so much it's been a pleasure it's been an honor thank you very much for being with me today hey thank you it's been it's been delightful hope you enjoyed this conversation guys as always you can get in touch with me at alec at mensdatingmastery.com that's alec with a c or if you'd like to learn more about MDM, you can do so at mensdatingmastery.com. And if you're enjoying the show, then please take a moment to subscribe, leave a five-star rating, along with a positive review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Aside from the obvious benefit that this has towards keeping the show alive and well, it is a great source of motivation to me personally. And on that note, I've received some positive messages from you guys over the past week which has meant the world to me, so thank you. Producing this podcast is a lot of work, and your feedback gives me the encouragement to keep moving forward when the going gets tough. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to Men's Dating Mastery, a podcast dedicated to improving the lives of men and the women around them.